Hi there, my name is Eric Hartley, and I am the worship pastor here at Thrive Church, and we're so grateful that you would spend time with us online. If there's anything at all that we can do for you and your family, please let us know. You can reach out to us either in the chat that goes along with this message, or you can go to our website, mythrivechurch.com, and reach out to us that way. I, all of our staff and also some of the elders of leadership are listed on there as well. So please feel free to reach out to us and let us know how we can serve you and your family. Because there's a lot of things that we, have, we all have concerns about. The condition of the world that we're in, the condition of our jobs, uh, health issues, regardless what it may be. Sometimes we just need a friend in our corner just to be our cheerleader for just a season to help us keep moving forward. And so if we could have that honor to help serve you in what you're going through, please let us do that. And it would be an honor to walk this season of life with you. And so what we're going to have is just a song, a sermon, a communion time, and then also another song at the very end. So if there's anything at all that during this sermon that you have questions about or anything at all, please reach out to us and let us know how we can either answer your questions or just help serve you. That's why we exist is to serve you. And so we're just going to sing this song, and it goes right along with uh, Steve's sermon, and it's King of Heaven, that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and His authority is above all. And there may be things happening in the world or even in your life that you may not like or understand, but in faith we trust in God, that He would work through all things to give us His benefit and His blessing. And there's things sometimes that are hard lessons that we go through. But in all those things, our God is faithful and just to take care of us. And so if you see the lyrics on your screen, please sing along and join in. And again, if there's anything at all that we can do for you, please let us know. So here we go, King of Heaven. Jesus. Let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater. You alone our Savior. Show the world your love. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come down. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name, King of heaven, come. We are children of your mercy, rescued in your glory. We cry, Jesus, set our hearts toward you. I would see you lifted high. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name, King of heaven, come. heaven come King of heaven come 
that's our prayer. O King of heaven, come, be our Savior. O King of heaven, come, King of heaven, come down, King of heaven, come down. Let your glory reign, shining like the day, King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name, King of heaven, come. Sing that last part again. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. Yeah, that's our prayer, that we would see you and your kingdom come. That our lives would be a great reflection of who you are. Just like the moon, it reflects the sun. And it affects the tides on the earth. And Lord, we want to do such a thing that we reflect you, your love, and how to treat one another. And that it also affects the world around us. Thank you for this time that we get to celebrate you, Jesus. We ask this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey, church, uh, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, would you open it to 1 Peter chapter 2? 1 Peter 2. Um, as you can tell, we're not in my house again, and I, am, I think my wife is super thankful about that. But we're making these steps to beginning to worship together again, and I am so thankful for that. I, I've, I've missed worshiping with all of y'all, although I'm very thankful for what we've been able to do through technology. And I will say this, uh, we're going to continue to either record a separate service to air or to soon live stream so that uh, if it's not the best time for you to join us, we'll be ready when you are. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. You know, I was thinking uh, the other day, it's been, I believe it was March 10th when I heard that a student in the neighboring school system um, had contracted COVID-19. And then March 11, I heard that as a church, we weren't going to be able to meet in the school that we were meeting in again, at least not while this was, was happening. And as a, as, a, as a church planter, that was a huge deal, just trying to figure out how are we going to meet, what are we going to do? But little did I know that that was really the tip of the spear of what was to come. And if you think back, think back just over these past few months, what it's been like, because it, we, we heard about folks now, even in, in, in the States and then in Indiana that had contracted COVID-19, and then we started to realize that this pandemic was real, and then we went into quarantine. And think about even in your life, you know, all the changes that happened. And then if, as if that weren't enough, we started to hear names like Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, riots, police being targeted. You know, have you ever seen one of those books, those worst case scenario books? 2020 has been, of a bit, been very similar to one of those worst case scenario books. Honestly, it's been a bit of a dumpster fire. And the question that we've been wrestling with as we, as we go through this crazy time, is how are we supposed to live as Christians through the middle of all this? And we've been looking at uh, 1 Peter, and if you, you remember, 1 Peter is written by the Apostle Peter that, that lived and walked with Christ, and he's a blue-collar guy. He's a fisherman by trade. Following Jesus was a long road of ups and downs and victories and failures. And what we read now was written near the end of Peter's life. 
And he's writing to these, these churches that are scattered across what, what's now uh, Turkey. They were dealing with persecution. And what they didn't know at this time was that the persecution was going to get worse before it got better. And in that situation, the Holy Spirit guides Peter to write these words. 1 Peter chapter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and glorify God on the day He visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord whether to the emperor's supreme authority or to governors as as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. You know, we planned this out a while back, and it it just strikes me of the the sovereignty and goodness of God. And even on the day that we begin our public um, worship services again, in the state that our country's in, and the, the things that we're going through, that this would be the text. This would be the text that that's chosen to to, to preach from. Peter says, dear friends, I I urge you. As a matter of fact, those of you who who grew up around the church will remember those old translations said, I beseech you, which may be a bit archaic. And it's this, I strongly urge you, is what Peter is saying. I strongly urge you as strangers and exiles. It's a particular phrase there, strangers and exiles. Uh, in, In the Old Testament, it shows up a couple of times. Abraham Remember, God sent him on a journey, and he was traveling through this land that wasn't his, and he, he, he needed to find a place to bury his wife after his wife had passed, and he, he says, I'm, I'm a stranger, and I'm an exile. In other words, I'm living among you, but this isn't my home. We also find it in Psalm 39. And what Peter's doing, uh, Peter is reminding us here is that we're strangers and exiles. In other words, we live here, but we have a different home. Because of our relationship with Christ, our home is heaven. And while we live here, we are citizens of heaven as well. He's saying, as we live as strangers and exiles... We need to remember this. I used to have a boss before I got into um, ministry, a boss that uh, what he'd always say, never forget who you are and who you represent. Now, he wanted us to remember that we represent the company, but Peter here is saying, I want you to remember that you represent the kingdom. You represent the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that you do. And so I'm just going to pick out from this text that we read, Five rules for strangers and exiles. This is rules to help us in, in when we're asking that question, how should we live in the middle of everything that we're seeing going on? And rule number one, the rule that kind of drives and underpins everything else, is this. Fear isn't all bad. Now, uh, verse 16, Peter reminds us that we're free, but this freedom that we have in Christ is rooted in and thrives in a healthy fear of God. I don't think anyone ever got this idea better than C.S. Lewis. If you remember, they made a movie out of it, but he wrote the, those kids' books, uh, The Chronicles of Narnia. And in the, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, he's take, there, here, let, let me set the scene. Uh, there's talking animals if you're, if you're not familiar with it. And there's these human children come and they're, they're, they're talking to Mr. Beaver. And Mr. Beaver is going to take them to meet Christ, the Christ figure. He's a giant lion uh, named Aslan. And in the, the scene, um, you know, that little Lucy goes, oh, I'll be so very afraid to, to, meet, to meet a lion. And, you know, it, 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 is it safe? And 
Mr. Beaver goes on to say, well, haven't, of course you'll be afraid. He's a lion. But he's good. That's sort of that picture when we think of the fear of God. Biblically speaking, uh, the fear of God is more than being afraid. But it's also more than just standing in awe. And in the Old Testament, when you read this term, the, the fear of the Lord, it's almost always accompanied by, if you look, it'll say the Lord in all capital letters. That's, that's His proper name, Yahweh. It's a covenant name. And He has bound Himself, this, this God, Yahweh, has bound Himself to us in a covenant love. In other words, in, in spite of my sin and in spite of my shame, this holy and righteous and incredible God draws me close and binds Himself to me and you out of love. And the, 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 the crazy irony in all of it is that the more clearly we see Him as high and lifted up and wonderful and holy, in other words, the more we realize that we shouldn't be close to Him, the closer He draws us to Him. And it doesn't just stop there. Paul explains this in a couple of places, but particularly in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, because we're sons, God sent His Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, uh, Abba, Father. Here, l- l- let me explain that. Since we don't know how to respond to this holy and incredible God, He fills us with His Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit within us cries out, Abba. Now, as a, if you know me, this is one of these pet peeves. We, we, we like to say it means Daddy. Well, that's close, but it, it doesn't really mean Daddy. Okay, picture this. If there's a room full, of, room full of guys and my son walks in and he yells, or my son or my daughter, and they yell, Dad. Now, every guy in the room may turn around, but I know the voice of my, my kids. And they would have my undivided attention because I would recognize it's him. Abba is a personal name. Abba means my dad. This holy and wonderful and incredible, exalted God binds Himself to you and I. We cry out, Abba. We recognize that we don't belong near Him. And yet He draws us close to Him through His Son. Now, that that is why Peter says, fear God. See, because when we get to that, that uh, undermines everything else and builds everything else up. Rule number two, honor where it is and isn't due. Notice Peter says, honor the emperor, honor the governors, matter of fact, honor everyone. And you go, what? What do you mean honor everyone? And this flows out of the the, the reality that every person you meet is made in the image of God. And they're precious to Him. And God has placed in His wisdom uh, structures around us to help us to live well. But what in the world does it mean for us to give honor to everyone at appropriate levels? What's it it mean to love everyone or honor everyone appropriately? And I've got a couple thoughts on that. And the first one is this. Be intentional to honor those who are different than us. Be intentional to honor those who are different than you. That that, that may have a different background. Oh, you and I are so quick to rush in to offer commentary on, on what is what and why things are. Maybe it's time that we just slow down and listen. Maybe it's time that we honor people by just hearing their stories. Finding out where they come from. You see, we live in a very individualistic society. Uh, we, We think that we operate alone, but the reality is, unless you're Tom Hanks in that movie Castaway, you grew up in a system. And there is a system around you. People don't come from a vacuum. You didn't, and neither does anyone else. And you and I simply can't claim that we're immune from bias or that we have no culpability for the state of the world 
that we live in. That, that, that's why you and I have to be quick to listen first. To learn to honor people by hearing their stories and to, to know where they come from. We've got to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Didn't Jesus say that the ones who thought that they could see everything were really the blind ones? But the ones who admitted that they were blind were the ones who had sight. And we may find that, that in honoring those who are different than us, come from different backgrounds that have different stories that we learn and that we grow and that God creates a new heart in us through that. But the second uh, way that here that we have to honor is we have to be careful to honor the government. Uh, verses 13 and 17, he talks about this. And I'm not going to lie, here's one of those that you wish that there was an asterisk in the Bible. Right? You wish that there was an asterisk here because then we would say, um, well, we could honor when such and such political system was in or when such and such party was in, depending on what side of the aisle that you're from. But Peter doesn't put that asterisk there, does he? And I'm going to be honest, I've had to do some repenting even in this past week here because we have to be careful to honor the government. The government, and I'm talking about at a national level and at a local level and at uh, our police as well. This becomes especially difficult. Let's, let's be honest. This becomes especially difficult when, when two parties that we're supposed to be honoring uh, experience tension. And when there's difficulty there, and you, you say, well, well, then how do we honor everyone there? We honor both parties in persistent dialogue, thoughtful dialogue, if need be, peaceful demonstration. You see, often in our world, the, the, the loudest uh, voice gets heard first. But solutions require something different. They require a wider perspective. Um, minister that I, and professor that I respect a lot, a guy by the name of Carla Skepton. He used to be at Johnson. He's now down at Harding University. Uh, he wrote this last week. He said, God, give us grace to move to the balcony. Get the bigger picture. Conceive wise, reasonable pathways out of our confusion. Let us bring to this not our angry selves or our shamed selves or our polarized selves, but our clearest centered selves. Slow down, pray, breathe, listen, love, dream, solve. And I would add to that, or I think the Apostle Peter would add to that, honor. But we've got to keep going here because we also have to be sensitive to honor the hurting. That's what he, one of those that we can't miss on. Uh, Paul talks about this in, in Romans chapter 12. He said, rejoice with those who rejoice, but weep. With those who weep. Come alongside people. Share in their grief. One thing I, I've, I've noticed is that as we deal with grief, or you'll see this at funerals, we, we always feel like we have to say something. We feel like we have to give a theology lesson or offer some sort of bumper sticker cliche. I'm here to tell you maybe the best thing that we can do is to just to listen. Put your arm around somebody. Maybe help do the dishes. To, to, to come alongside. Um, we don't have to teach in those scenarios. And just to be honest, one of the most painful things that you can do to a hurting person is have them have to justify while they, why they're hurting. Now, it does seem that something needs to be said here, that in honoring the hurting, sometimes there will need to be confrontation and accountability because we have to be willing to stand up for those that we honor and those that we love. Now, this last one may be the most difficult because we have to be diligent to honor those who are wrong. Remember, Peter says honor everyone. You know, when I watch on the videos and I see the men who chased down Ahmed Arbery, or Arbery, 
And then I see senseless taking of lives. And then I see folks who uh, um, are using peaceful protest to turn into riots to cover up illicit, illicit activity. I say, how in, the world, how in the world do we honor them? And the reality is, is we're still required to honor them, and we honor them with appropriate justice and a fair trial and a proper legal system. We honor them by addressing systems and we need to take it further than this because we need to make these things personal. Because well, what about those of us who see injustice occurring around us and we walk along the other side of the street? We don't get involved. It can't just be about them as the source of the problem. We've got to take an honest look inward. We've got to look at uh, uh, our lives and our church. You see, because Peter says you honor everyone appropriately. But the third rule that we're going to get to here is um, one that's going to be even a little, it's easier. It's this, always love the fam. Verse 16, uh, Peter says, love the brothers and sisters. In other words, there should be a special love set aside for your brothers and sisters in Christ. First John 4, 7, the Apostle John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. In this context, he's talking about specifically Christians. Jesus prays this in his high priestly prayer, John 17. Christian love is a sacrificial commitment to one another based on the character of who God is. It's not necessarily a, a mushy sort of love, you know, that's all excited about church potlucks and get-togethers, although that may be part of it. It's a commitment to one another based on who God is. You see, because the church, Jesus' church, is designed to be a structure support system for itself. It's designed that when one falls down, that there's others to come alongside to help up. That where one is weak, another comes along who's strong. Where one needs something, others can provide. That's the way that Jesus has designed His church. That's why He gives different gifts to all, to, to, to all the different folks within the church. And I'm going to tell you this. In an increasingly divided country, what a, what a time to see a united church. What a time to see a church who isn't divi divided, but who comes alongside and supports and loves one another. That's why Peter's saying, hey, let them see what you're doing. Let them see who you are. And I love that right now we're starting to see in increasing ways black churches and white churches talking more. But what if we can take it further than that and we worship together more? And we serve together more? And we love together more. You've got to always love the fam. Fourth rule we grab towels, not pitchforks. We grab towels, not pitchforks. Uh, Peter says, conduct yourselves honorably. Let your good deeds, right? Let them speak for themselves because when people start to talk trash about the church and when people are pointing fingers at the church, Oh, well, I, I loved it when I was a kid, um, The Wizard of Oz. It was a brand new movie when I was a kid. And uh, when, when the tin man finally gets to meet the wizard, you know, the wizard says, back where I'm from, we have folks that go around and all they do is good deeds all day. We call them good deed doers. Doers. Well, he could have said, we call them Christians. That's the picture that we want to be known as. Because sooner or later, folks are going to point the finger at the church and say, you're not welcome. What you believe isn't welcome. And we want them to see what we're doing. It's, it's like uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where remember where the people start to grab the pitchforks. 
because Frankenstein's, uh, uh, his creation isn't welcome. And he's saying sooner or later people are going to grab pitchforks, but I'm here to tell you that Christians grab towels, not pitchforks. And what I mean by that is you think of Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. Stops and takes off his robe, wraps a towel around his waist. And he stops to, to serve and to love. And you say, well, yeah, that, I get that in the church, but hold on. Jesus washed Judas' feet too. He loved folks that were going to cause him an inc- incredible pain. And honestly, isn't uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2, that is the whole point of Philippians 2. When you read it, it's that Jesus, we we hear a lot of talk about privilege these days, Jesus didn't consider equality with God something for him to hold on to. And he pours himself out, and he serves, and he loves good deed doer. We won't silence the foolish talk of people about the church by you and I arguing about our rights. Let them see something different. Let them see love. Let them see honor. Let them see us doing good things. Last rule, rule five, be an infomercial. Be an infomercial. Here's the deal. Your life and my life tells a story. Now, it, it, it can be a story of our accomplish, uh, accomplishments or a story of what we've collected. Or I, I hear us like to say this, you know, I come from the school of hard knocks. And a, a story of the difficulty that we've been through. But I'm here to tell you the best stories are always redemption stories. Let your life be a story, a, a picture of what Christ does. Because Christ did not come to make good people better. He didn't come to make bad people better. He came to make dead people alive. That's what He does. And let's make sure that the story of our lives bears witness to the truth of His gospel. Our, our, our task, think about this. We've been reminded that our home is heaven. Exiles and strangers. Our task as a church and as people who follow this Jesus is to make this look a little more like that. That's going to happen by us telling our story. The story of what Jesus can do. Tell the story of the way that He comes and that He can take brokenness and put it back together. He can take addiction and bring freedom. He can take broken marriages and bring wholeness. He can take sin and 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 remove it and bring not a clean slate, but a whole new critter. Our story should tell his story about the way that he makes me a free man rather than a slave to sin. You see, my fear in God isn't a fear of punishment, but it's a, it's a fear that stands back and say, I, I realize I don't belong here, but I'm so thankful. So thankful to be here. And it's a story that honors us with His presence when all we do is bring shame. And it's a, it's a story of how He showed us love even when we didn't love him. And it's a story of how he wrapped a towel around his waist and he washed our feet when we would refuse to serve in the, low, in, in the simplest of ways. It's a story about how his entire ministry was a picture of the kingdom. Church, I need this in my own life. We need this as a church. We need this as a state. We need this as a country. The world needs us now to take this serious, to listen to the Word of God, and to to not just keep it here, but to move it to here and then into our hands. Because this will define the way that we go through 2020. 
in the way that we go forward from there. Peter put it pretty simple. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Back in the early days of the church, there was a, a, a lawyer who came to Christ, and he became one of the real powerful thinkers in the first few years. His name was Tertullian. And when, when folks were, were talking trash about the church, one of his writings, he said, let them look and see, and just say, see how they love one another. Oh, that that would be said of us. And I'm here to tell you, if today, if this all sounds crazy to you because you don't know Jesus as Lord, I want to invite you that by faith, put your, put your trust in Him to realize that there is a different home that is greater than all of this mess that we've seen in 2020. And there is a home where you can be welcome regardless of the sin and struggle and or what's happened in you or to you. Because there is a God that loves you so much that He sent His one and only Son. That if you would put your faith in Him, you wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 If that's you today, reach out. Reach out through the comment section. Reach out uh, somehow. Uh, there's, a, there's a connect card. Somehow, I'll get in touch with you today. We will talk about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to have hope. What it means to have a new life. If you are a Christian and you, you've heard this and, and you're like, yeah, but I don't agree with this and I don't agree with this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you there are lots of times when when I hear new ideas or I hear things happening around us, and I'm like, yeah, I get that. But you and I need to let God's Word speak into the way that we respond. We have to have a higher authority that governs us. Let God's Word challenge the way that we see the world around us and the way that we see the Christians around us and honestly, even the way that we see ourselves. Church, pray with me. Father God, I thank you for the truth of your word. And I thank you for the hope of tomorrow because of your son. I thank you for the comfort that we have through your Holy Spirit that cries out, Abba. Align our hearts and our minds to your word and your purpose, your character today. All for your glory. In Christ's name. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus 
Jesus, you're still enough. You keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Promise still stands. So great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Your promise still stands. So great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. You never fail me or forsake us in our deepest darkest moments you have seen value in us we could never go someplace that you are not mindful of us our situation our health our family everything Lord you notice everything and so Lord we just want to turn our hearts to you and say thank you for even though the battle may be great you are greater And so, Father, we just thank you for this time that we can just celebrate that you are greater. You are mighty. You are powerful. And you are for us. In Zephaniah, it says, Lord, that we rejoice over you with singing, and you do the same. You comfort us with your love. And, Lord, we just want to say, Father, we thank you that you are our God. And we are your people. So, Father, may we just take this time, turn our hearts to you for our time of communion and say thank you for a life that was just lived out and also a life that was given, that we would see you in your kingdom and in your glory one day. Thank you for that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And so at this time, we're going to go ahead and just transition into our time of communion. And uh, one of the verses, and it was probably the the verse that I learned first when I first started going to church when I was 16 years old. And it's the the verse that just been imprinted upon my heart because it spoke so much about where I was at in my life. I was taught to be a good person. I was taught to treat people well, but that's not good enough. I mean, it's good, but it's not enough. And it says that in Romans 5, 8, That God demonstrates his love for us in this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That he saw our future, he saw us as individuals. Even in the Old Testament it says that 
God knew us when we were knit together in our mother's womb. As we were being formed, as we were being created, God knew us. And so even though from the time of zero to 15, 16 years old, I was just trying to be good enough, but it wasn't enough. You know, who is better than this person? I mean, we can find the worst and the worst of people, but there's only one standard, and that was lived out by Jesus himself, to be sinless, to be blameless, and yet that's not me. And so when I read that verse, that while I was at my worst, God still saw value in Eric, and he sees value in you, that regardless what our situation is, regardless what we've been through, he still wants you to be your dad, to adopt you, to be his kid. I've got two kids that I adopted from Ukraine, and it's probably the second or third greatest decision I ever made in my life was to become their dad. And I laid that on top of what God has done for us, and it's the same thing. Paid a price, went a great distance, went from heaven to earth to live out a life, paid a price so that we could have a relationship. I went halfway around the world, spent a lot of money, and yet it was worth every penny. I would absolutely spend four or five times as much to do it all over again. But I'm so grateful that in my spiritual walk that I don't have to be enough. I just have to be his. And so as we take this time of communion, if you've got the bread and juice with you at home or maybe some juice that you could get in a piece of bread, and the, the blood is represented in the cup, that it was a blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. The bread is just like his body that was broken for us. And it's a personal relationship. There's a lot of people I care a lot about. There's a very few amount of people that I would just be willing on the spot to go die for. But yet he, he sent his son to die for all of humanity. And that's such a powerful act of love. And so will you pray with me? Father, thank you for that great gift and that great example. To be sacrificial, to see value in people. And I pray that as a society that we see that more. We see more value in people than we see differences. So, Father, may we take this time to celebrate you in this act of, of celebration and an act of worship as we take the bread and the juice together. And we celebrate the life of Jesus, our Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is a mighty God, the Savior of the world. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.